this morning's Torah portion is called Vayachel, and Vayachel is Hebrew for and he assembled and tells of the making of the tabernacle and its sacred vessels and it covers from Exodus 35 through Exodus 38 verse 20. Now our parsha in chapter 35 verse 1 begins with the words Vayachel Moshe et kol adat b'nei Yisrael and Moshe assembled all of the assembly of Israel Vayomer Elohim and said to them, Ele hadvarim asher tzivua Adonai la'asot atim. These are the words which Adonai has commanded that you should do them. And you know, it's in this passage when we're reintroduced to the Shabbat as a time that we can meet with Hashem outside of time and space that he actually says, do Shabbat. Not just keep Shabbat and not Shemor as in guard sh Shabbat as in Deuteronomy 5, but to actually do it. It is something that we are to do, even while ceasing from doing in all things physical, it is something we do in the spiritual by resting in Him. And what did He command them in this parasha? Instructions in regards to the development of the tabernacle a place where God can dwell with us inside of time and space, although his spirit is beyond time and space. And that is why he first deals with this set-apart time, in which we can transcend time and space and rest in unifying oneness with him, instructing and reminding us about Shabbat in verse 2, saying, Work is to be done for six days, but the seventh day is a holy Shabbat for you a Sabbath of complete rest to Adonai. Whoever does any work, then, will die. You know, ultimately, if we do not enter into covenant with our divine source by keeping his covenant day, which sets us apart as his covenant people, the end will be end in death. Even Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. And so, sin is the transgression of the Torah, 1 John 3.4. And he's telling us, not that he's going to punish us for not keeping Shabbat, but that if we do not connect with him, our end will be leading to death. And it is here that we derive our only new mitzvah in both parashas. Surprisingly, there's only one new commandment introduced here, which is the 89th mitzvah in Torah from Genesis 1-1 that we've been covering, that the courts must not inflict punishment on Shabbat because that word then will die connotates after Shabbat. And so the earliest sages derived this 89th commandment from this passage. Thus, Vayechel has a substantial amount of instruction pertaining to the establishment of the tabernacle, as well as direction from God relating to the Israelites through their honoring of the Sabbath. This portion starts off with Hashem issuing commandments relating to the Shabbat. Bayakel records the actual implementation of God's instructions on how to build the Mishkan tabernacle recounted earlier in Parsha Teruma that we studied together. It speaks of every man who has a function in the tabernacle or in building it. The gifts received from the Israelites that would be used for the tabernacle and it ends with the tabernacle's construction finished. Indeed, much of Vayakel is almost an exact repeat of Teruma, the only apparent difference being that the details, which in Teruma are prefaced with the words, and they shall make, are here presented after the fact, saying, and they made. Now, I'd like to just cover some different concepts within these two parashas. We're not necessarily just going to be reading it verbatim, but diving deeper into some of the concepts uh, introduced or reintroduced. And so the first is this issue of keeping Shabbat and its importance. We read in our opening verses of Shemot, which is Exodus 35 verses 1 and 2, Then Moses assembled all the congregations of the sons of Israel and said to them, these are the things that Hashem has commanded you to do. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to Hashem. 
whoever does any work on it, will die. Our creator and designer knew that we needed one day of rest in seven for physical well-being as well as spiritual refreshment and growth. By keeping Shabbat, we place fellowship and worship of Him above all of our personal, physical needs and above all things of interest in this life. The Israelites, who were constructing the tabernacle, as well as working in their daily tasks in the camp during the Exodus, were working long and hard hours under difficult conditions. Hashem told them to take a day of complete and total rest, what the Hebrew calls a holy Sabbath day of rest to Hashem. Hashem is reminding the people that even as a sacred work as building the tabernacle, the work must be suspended on Shabbat. This is because Hashem ceased from His creative work in creating even a place for Him to dwell with us within time and space. He ceased His creative work and thus we should cease to do any creative work in our lives as well, even when it is to the glory of God, as building the tabernacle was. The day each week which celebrates his eternal covenant with the people of Israel is to be a time where we can connect with him apart from all things in this physical world. Every week we are reminded of his faithfulness his sure word, that his covenant with us is forever, and our ultimate security is that very covenant with him. Unfortunately, many would believe that God would not ask us today to take the seventh day and consecrate it entirely to him. After all, there are there not things that we need to do, we think, on Shabbat, on Saturday? Contrary to what many believe, God indeed has the right to tell us today that we should consecrate a day entirely to Him. He wants to commune with His people, and by resting in Him, we are not only rejuvenating our bodies, but also rejuvenating our spirits by delving deeper and deeper into His Word and removing ourselves from outside worldly influences. And it separates those of us who remember to separate it in holiness as His set-apart people. In fact, there can be no sanctification without the keeping of Shabbat holy. And though none of us honor the Sabbath command perfectly in our thoughts as well as in our actions, if we follow Hashem's example from creation and the example of Messiah ben Yosef in striving to honor the Shabbat to the best of our ability, we will be blessed and drawn into closer relationship with Hashem. Now, our sages derived that there are just like the ten categories and the ten commandments that I shared with you in past weeks are categories for all of the Torah laws. Similarly, there are 39 types of work forbidden on Shabbat, or 39 categories of work that are derived from the 39 times that work is mentioned in regard to not doing even the tabernacle building on Shabbat. People familiar with the Sabbath laws know that the written Torah does not list all the specific activities prohibited on the Sabbath, but the oral Torah does. And interestingly, the rabbis in the Mishnah in Shabbat 49a tractate state that the Torah hints at the activities that are banned from this passage in relation to what they shouldn't do even in building the tabernacle. These hints are based on two rabbinical teachings that are applied by the rabbis at all times. Firstly, when facts or incidents are placed near one another in the Bible, one can derive a lesson from the just juxtaposition. And secondly, uh, halakha, that means a Jewish uh, law or principle in which we walk spiritually, can be learned from such things as counting the number of times an item appears in the Torah. Thus, the rabbi stated that because the Sabbath is mentioned near the laws of the building of the tabernacle, we are informed that those labors necessary to construct the tabernacle are forbidden on the Sabbath. And, secondly, since the term malakha, which is found in the discussion of the Shabbat, that's our word for work, 
it appears 39 times in this passage that the scripture is teaching that there are 39 categories of prescribed work that we do not do on this holy day, Shabbat. Thus, the rabbis enumerated the 39 major categories with hundreds of subcategories of labor that were forbidden. We call that avot malacha, service and work, based on the types of work that were related to the construction of the tabernacle in the wilderness, which ceased on the Sabbath. And now I'll give you a brief overview of those categories. The first activities that cannot be performed on the Sabbath are basic tasks connecting with pre preparing the showbread of the temple, which includes even sowing the seed for the grain that is used in bread making. So this includes sowing and plowing, reaping, binding, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting, kneading, and any form of baking we are not to do on the Shabbat. If they couldn't even do it for God's house, how can we justify doing it in our house? Next is the work related to making the coverings in the tabernacle and the vestments used by the Kohanim, which include even the shearing of sheep for the wool, bleaching, carding, dyeing, spinning, stretching material, making loops, sewing, threading needles, weaving, separating materials, tying a knot or untying a knot, and tearing. Also are activities concerned with the writing and preparation of parchment from animal skin, which would have been used in the temple service. And this includes even trapping or hunting on the Shabbat, slaughtering, skinning, curing hides, scraping pelts, making out a hide to make ready for cutting, or even cutting something we do not do on Shabbat. That's one of the reasons why even when we do the Kiddush on Friday night and we have our beautiful challah braided, after saying the blessing over it, we pass it around and pull from it different portions of bread, but we don't use a knife. We don't cut the hala, as you may have noticed if you've ever opened up Shabbat in a Jewish home. This all goes back to the tabernacle and the things that were done in the tabernacle that God told them to cease on the seventh day, as well as writing and erasing and constructing, as you would in a blueprint or even in um, transmitting a scroll, as a scribe would do. We don't do any writing, erasing, constructing, building, or demolishing we don't kindle a flame, which means lighting or even including extinguishing a flame. If you light candles before Shabbat uh, begins, you should not put out those candles. You should let them go out naturally. Also carrying things from private to public domain and vice versa, and putting the finishing touches to a piece of work that you may have already begun before the Sabbath began. This gives you a little deeper insights into why our people are so careful not to do certain things on Shabbat because it goes back to even God telling us to cease our work that related to these 39 different elements of building the tabernacle. Some scholars who attempt to find reasons for the commandments, such as Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, suggest that the 39 categories are comprised of melachet, machshevet, a phrase found in Genesis 35, verse 33, which they translate as any creative act. And of course, this would fit with the Genesis account because even God ceased from his creative act. Creative acts, they say, are forbidden on the Sabbath to remind Jews that God created the world and he set the first example by ceasing to perform all acts of creation on that first Shabbat. Now, let's talk about the making of the sanctuary. The tabernacle is a picture of how God wants to dwell in the midst of his people and how he wants us as his people to honor and obey him. We all are awed and amazed at the detail that our Father gives to the construction of this mobile holy place in the wilderness. It shows the importance he places on having everything according to the correct spiritual pattern. And as we grow spiritually, we begin to align our lives 
with those spiritual patterns and principles that we see revealed in scripture we align our lives to and then we become a holy place for his indwelling spirit we are told that it was the chiefs of each tribe that brought the precious stones upon which the names of the tribes were to be inscribed for the breastplate earlier in exodus 28 the people are told to bring the offerings for the tabernacle and also this time to give of themselves and their talents for the construction of the tabernacle and they respond so well that they actually have to be instructed to cease bringing their offerings hashim calls for those of a willing heart and this is what he's looking for in us. Can you imagine if we were all so giving that we would have to tell people to stop giving because the kingdom work is being completed with all of the needs being met? He not only asks for us to have a willing heart to give, but also to volunteer, as is translated in the Targum by Ibn Yanuk. And literally, another way that it's translated is He's calling people whose hearts are lifted up to him to give willingly of themselves or whose natural talents are naturally awakened from our love for Hashem. He's given a certain gifts and we use those giftings as well as our financial resources for his glory and to bring souls into his kingdom and to prepare the coming kingdom as even Ezra and Rambam would interpret it. Also, it's sometimes interpreted that each person brought according to the dictates of his heart. So there's different ways that this has been translated in the ages, but you get the point of how beautiful it is. What a natural outflowing of us realizing that everything we have from our life to our giftings to our resources is his. So why would we withhold anything for his glory and for his kingdom and to bring his presence in the midst of his people as the tabernacle's purpose was? Exodus 35 10 says and let all who are skilled and there was a great variety of skills among them from their from the time of their sojourn in Egypt which means that they must have been trained in Egypt for a great variety of trades and they came the men with the women they came one on top of another men and women in an intermingled throng and in two mornings they had brought all the necessary donations the princes then wished to bring their donations but could not because moshe had already given the orders let neither man nor woman bring any more so the princes were distressed and said seeing that we were not privileged to participate in the offerings to the mishkan let us give towards the garments of the high priest this is why when the Mishkan was completed, the princes took the initiative and were the first to bring offerings for its dedication that we read about in Numbers 7, as well as Midrash Rabbah. In chapter 38, verse 24, 29 talents of gold were recorded in being used in the tabernacle. A talent is approximately 98 pounds. And that means there was about 2,842 pounds of gold used in the tabernacle. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was overlaid in gold, and the um, altar of incense, uh, as well as the table of showbread, was overlaid with gold. And then the menorah was pure gold, hammered gold. This means that of the 600,000 adult males, each contributed about four and two-thirds pounds to the making of the temple. This does not include silver and precious stones and other materials used in the temple. And figuring the price of gold at $450 per ounce, the value of the gold used would have been about $20 million. But of course, in today, with inflation, it's worth a lot more. There's really no way to calculate the value of the precious stones and other material used, but I would guess that there was another 15 or 20 million in materials used in constructing the tabernacle. Now, this brings us to chapter 36, where we then are given the history of Betzalel and Ohaliav and their creative gifting that God gave them for crafting the different pieces of furnishings in the tabernacle 
And Moshe said to the children of Israel, See, Hashem has called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with Chokmah, wisdom, and with Bina, insight, understanding, and with Da'at, knowledge, and with all Malacha, work, knowledge and how to work, and how to make plans, Mahashavot, to work in gold, and in silver, and in copper, and in the cutting of precious stones for settings, and in carving wood, to make all the work of planned Melachet, Mahashavet, and to be able to teach as he put in his heart he and Oholiav, son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan he filled them with wisdom of heart to do all the work you know when somebody's filled with wisdom of heart they love doing what they do naturally it is such a blessing for a craftsman to do his work and such a joy and these men were imbued with the wisdom of heart to do all of the melachet work of the craftsman and weaver and embroidery even in blue and in purple and in scarlet and in linen and weaving, makers of all malacha work and makers of plans. This word malacha in its different forms and malachet and machashavet are these word for work that I was mentioning earlier that is used 39 times in the different categories of work. Malakha is used for creative work, the type of action in which man emulates the creator as a co-creator and is the word used for the creative acts of Hashem in Genesis 1. The word for normal work or service is also referred to Avodah as it is said the three pillars uh, that sustain this world are Torah and Avodah Hashem which means our service to God because of our love for God in the vertical plane and avodah to our fellow man on the horizontal plane. And that is really what Torah instruction is all about, it is the laws and principles of how to love God on the vertical plane and how to show that love by recognizing him in each of his sons and daughters and serving them on the horizontal plane. And so avodah in both its forms is what is sustaining the world. And, you know, it is the sins of selfishness and lack of service to our fellow man and greed and unkindness that have destroyed cities in the past more than any other sin, such as in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, where they would not help even a sojourner or visitor to their town. Hashem asked Moshe to appoint Bezalel from the tribe of Judah, representing the southern kingdom and Oholiav from the tribe of Dan, representing the northern kingdom, to be craftsmen overseeing all the work of the tabernacle. Bezalel and Oholiav represent the ministry of the two houses, united and working together as we are now seeing come together in our day. The northern kingdom of Israel, which was assimilated into the nations and other religions, who didn't know their identity and didn't know Torah are now coming back together with Judah and united in love and working together with joy, which this is such a beautiful glimpse of in these two men. And it's interesting to look at their names, as Bethlehel's name means under the shadow of Elohim. And true to his name, he was under a special overshadowing of the Almighty's wisdom and spirit, specially chosen and anointed for the task of working the gold, silver, and bronze, and every form of carved work. And Oholiav's name means, the father is my tent, or my father's tent. And here he's building the tent of meeting, the Ohel. So you can even hear the word tent in his name, Ohel. The implications of his name are that he was one who lived in the presence of Hashem and that was where he chose to dwell. Only one who had such a relationship could be used as an anointed vessel for the impartation of his presence into the physical things which he wove, the designs and embroidering of blue, purple, and scarlet wool, 
and linen and for the hangings of, and for the carved work. The team of Bezalel and Oholiav were a team of wise-hearted artisans, and they taught others how to do this work as well. Headed by Bezalel ben Yuri from the tribe of Judah and Oholiav ben Achisamech from the tribe of Dan, they set about the task of fashioning these fifteen materials into a dwelling for the Divine Presence to inhabit. Notice all the different abilities of these two men. Firstly, a special calling from Hashem with a divine gifting to use with their special skills and their special abilities and their special knowledge in every craft. They had the ability to actually make the things as well as the ability to teach and instruct and oversee others in the performance of those things. Their anointing was with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, as it says in chapter 31, verse 3. And they were filled with the Ruach HaKodesh in these things. The Hebraic understanding, according to Rashi, is that wisdom is what one hears from another and learns, but Bina understanding is what one understands on their own out of the things they have learned. And the Ot, knowledge, is divine inspiration. They, as vessels, had been previously prepared and anointed in these qualities. Hashem filled Bezalel and Oholiav with all the wisdom and skill to create exactly the correct designs for the assembly of the tabernacle after the pattern of heavenly things. Not one design was added or deleted. All was done exactly according to the heavenly pattern. The curtains, the veils, the coverings are described in great detail and all relate to ministries of Hashem through the body of Yeshua. Yeshua is the physical representation of the tabernacle that we are to emulate and grow into in our sanctification. And everything in the tabernacle points to him and his ministry. We are made in the image and likeness of Hashem. He lives in us and through us, and therefore the design of the tabernacle is the design of his body as well. One of the reasons for the building of the tabernacle was that it would be a visible and constant reminder to the children of Israel that each of them was created to be a tabernacle of his presence, every bit as powerful as the Mishkan itself. Every detail mattered, even down to the pegs and the cords which held the Mishkan erect and in position on the ground. They were as important as the sacred vessels within. And all the components of his tabernacle, even though their functions differ and the appearance varies so that some do not have a becoming appearance, all are necessary parts of his tabernacle. And that's the way it is with the body of Messiah today. Each one of us are essential. Each of us come in different shapes and sizes, backgrounds, nationalities, tongues, but we complement each other in unity when we're used for his indwelling glory to shine through to the nations. In this same way, each individual me member of his spiritual tabernacle matters, and no part can regard the other as unnecessary or unimportant. Therefore, the work in constructing the tabernacle needed to be inspired by the mind of the one who conceived it. All of the production of the raw materials, their construction and finishing work, was the inspiration of Hashem through his chosen vessels. Therefore, it came into the category of creative work. The hands of those used in its making were inspired, energized, and controlled by the spirit of Hashem, and carried the impartation of his anointing in their very fiber. This, we are told, when Bezalel is designated by Moshe, is called Melachet Machashevet, purposeful work, artistic workmanship. Sometimes it's translated like in the New King James. The closest man can come to the divine synthesis of design and execution in one's life. And when Bezalel is appointed to build a sanctuary for Hashem, he brings to fulfillment his desire to have a dwelling place on earth, 
that is for him to take up his abode with us, the full realization of which will be in the new heaven and the new earth. And when we safeguard Shabbat, we build him a sanctuary in time and in space in our lives. How much effort do we go through before entering the holy place with God? To have the glory of God to fill our tabernacles, as Rabbi Shaul says, Know ye not that your bodies are the tabernacle for the indwelling of the Most High? We should complete spiritually what Moshe did physically. We need to cleanse ourselves. We need to be anointed and prepare the sanctuary. We need to hang the curtains, offer sacrifices and sweet-smelling incense, which are our prayers to Hashem. And then he will come into our temple with glory and with power. Second Corinthians six sixteen through chapter seven one says, For we are the temple of the living God, as Hashem has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their Elohim, and they will be my people. Therefore come out from them and be separate, says Hashem. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for Hashem. The great beauty and glory of the natural tabernacle was an earthly representation of the spiritual glory of the heavenly tabernacle and its ministries the final demonstration of which will be manifested in the New Jerusalem after the Messianic Age. And in John's vision, in Revelation 21, verse 10 through 21, we see all manner of precious stones representative of the spiritual glory of that city. The scriptures begin in Genesis with a sanctuary as well, in that God created the Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, as an enclosed place where Adam and Hava had a meeting with him in time and space. They enjoyed this fellowship while they kept the covenant to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But after they sinned, the cherubim were placed at the entrance to guard the way to the tree of life. The tabernacle constructed in the wilderness and later in the land formed the second place of meeting of Hashem and his people. It was an enclosed place separated and sanctified from this world to accommodate a physical manifestation of his presence. And in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies represented the environment of the Garden of Eden, its perimeter even having the cherubims embroidered into the curtains which enclosed it to remind us of the representation of the cherubim which stood at the entrance to the literal garden. This garden is like a portal to another dimension in which the physical can interact with the spiritual. And upon the cover of the ark also, within the most holy place, were the two cherubim facing each other with wings stretching over the ark. They also were placed in a position of covering or guarding the ark. And the Garden of Eden represents the spiritual environment that Hashem intended for his children to fellowship with him in. After they sinned, unfortunately, the two cherubim were placed at the entrance to the garden to guard the way to the tree of life, so that it wouldn't be available to them while in their sinful state, very similar to the way the veil separated the holy place from the most holy place, until such a time that sin can be done away with, and then Hashem can dwell with us at one minute, just as on the Day of Atonement, that was the only day that the high priest could go in to the most holy place. But Heavenly Father, through the plan of salvation, is working to make us at one with Him again by restoring Torah to our hearts and our minds so that we live it out naturally. And this is why Yeshua prayed in John 17, Father, may they be one in You, even as I am one in You, looking forward to that great day. Now, upon the cover of the ark, the cherubim are overshadowing and guarding the contents of the two tablets of stone that contain the covenant between Hashem and his people, the terms of the agreement, which represent having it written upon our hearts and our minds, his principles of selfless love, the Torah. 
and the cherubim over the ark are guarding the way to the tree of life in essence, the covenant relationship in the Torah. The way back to the Garden of Eden, the full restoration of relationship with Hashem, is through the covenant He has made in the keeping of His life-giving principles. And this is why people that reject it don't know what they're doing. Moshe said, I present before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Choose life and blessings. But God will not usurp the individual's free will, and so each individual must choose to return to those life-giving principles and thereby return to the restoration of full relationship at oneness with him. As the cherubim were placed at the entrance of the garden, so the cherubim are placed at the entrance into the ark. The way is in first through the brazen altar of sacrifice, meaning we need to die daily. We need to die to self and the ego. Then we can be cleansed in the laver of mikvah, and then into the holy place where we begin our sanctification process being set apart through the ruach of truth, leading us back to Torah and constant communication with Hashem as exemplified in the, the altar of incense. Then within the veil, in the final steps of complete sanctification, the Day of Atonement experience, where the true worshiper can enter into his glorious presence in perfection and holiness. Yeshua, our High Priest, has in entered in behind the veil and sprinkled the mercy seat on our behalf to make atonement for our sin. He has entered in between the cherubim and partaken of the tree of life for all who have come into covenant relationship with him, as Revelation 22, 1-5 hints at. We must follow He who has gone before us in full surrender of our lives to Hashem's will and purpose, obeying His principles by the Ruach Spirit in complete obedience to Him in order to enter into His glory. May each one of us prepare our bodies as holy places where the Ruach HaKodesh can dwell and shine forth to others and may we be blessed to see Mashiach come speedily and in our day and the temple rebuilt soon so that we can have this beautiful Shekinah dwelling with us once again.